Hey, Dr. Christensen here with you. So how can you not be so hungry? This is a question that I get a lot, and this is something that I've struggled with myself over the years. You know, when my diets have been really restrictive, I've had hunger that was out of control that I just couldn't stop. And many have talked about that too, to where they feel like they know about how much food they should eat and which foods they can eat, but can't always just, it's not that simple. You know, sometimes trying to manage hunger feels like holding your breath. The longer you do it, the harder it gets to continue. And finally, your body just rebels and you have things you don't want to have. So there's a couple of ways that you can go about modifying habits and foods to reduce that and get a better handle on your hunger and have it be more what your body needs and not really hijack and derail your efforts. And that's what this, that's what this is about. There's 13 tips, tips I want to share with you that will help you better manage that and give you better control over what you're eating. So let's dive on in. The first one, one of the biggest ones, is getting adequate protein. Lots of data has shown that our sense of being filled up is based upon our protein intake more than just our calorie intake. So what that means is if the foods you're eating are low in protein, you won't really feel full until you eat enough of them to get some protein, even if that means a lot of food. So the more you've got protein-dense food, the more quickly you fill up. And this has been shown in other ways too. When calories are equal, protein foods have the biggest impact upon satiety more so than others. Other relevant factors are they also stabilize your blood sugar for longer periods of time. And for some of us, we're getting our real out of control cravings when the blood sugar drops and just plummets abruptly. So protein helps to stop that. And there's having enough, but there's also getting it like as a regular dosage. And in terms of the blood sugar benefits, it's more a matter of having regular dosages of protein every, every several hours. <clears throat> protein also has the biggest effect upon improving body composition, meaning just muscle mass. And the more you've got good muscle mass, the more it will also regulate your blood sugar and help you burn more calories passively. Okay, number two, another favorite would be resistant starch. So like protein, resistant starch makes blood sugar steady. And specifically, it does that by making a coating around the intestinal tract that delays how quickly other food is absorbed. And it's kind of a paradox because it makes you absorb minerals better and more efficiently, but it makes you absorb dense calories in a way that is more gradual and doesn't require insulin as much to manage. We get that from beans, legumes, also from underripe bananas. Uh, potatoes are really rich sources of that, especially when they're boiled or heated at lower temperatures as such. But yeah, all good sources of resistant starch and does a lot for decreasing appetite. And protein and resistant starch are especially game changers when you start the day with them. So when you have them early along in your first meal, they can affect the whole next 24-hour cycle and make it easier in terms of appetite. Next up would be food frequency. Now, for a while, there was the advice that if you ate really often, that by itself would somehow magically make you lose weight because of the thermic effect of food. Well, that didn't pan out. So, so no, eating 10 times a day won't do something magical for weight, but there may be a food frequency that works better for you than others. And if hunger and cravings are out of control, you should experiment and you may do better by having a few more frequent meals. Personally, I do really well to have about six a day. I mean, no joke. I'll have the main three. They're not really all that huge in terms of the food amounts, but I'll also have an extra meal before a workout in the morning, mid-morning and mid-afternoon, and then maybe some fruit or something else later in the day before bed as well, some fruit or some veggies. So play with your food frequency and think about the other rules too. Get protein with those more frequent meals and see if that makes a difference. Yes, there's an idea that eating less frequent, you could engage in various types of autophagy or other types of regulatory mechanisms that might help in terms of longevity. It's pretty speculative in all honesty. Uh, the main thing that affects your health really is your body size more than those other factors. So if eating more frequently helps you control your weight better, it's well worth it. However, it's also worth knowing that the food quantities still matter. So when you're eating more frequently, if you're not eating smaller amounts, it won't work. <laughs> the math won't work in your favor. Uh, Pre-meal hydration. There's been some data about hydration in general and also pre-meal hydration specifically. 
So before a meal, having a good intake of water. Whenever I talk about it, it always makes me thirsty. <laughs> you know, shoot for a solid half a quart to a quart in the uh, 15 minutes or so before a meal and watch and see how quickly you fill up. There's been data saying that our satiety is also affected by total volume, by just the volume of stuff in there. So that's an argument towards high fiber foods, but also a lot of, a lot of water. And there are also times to where thirst cues may feel like hunger cues. So if you are chronically dehydrated, that can be a factor. And if you find yourself having some random craving, see if a big glass of water and a few minutes rest and distraction don't take care of it, because sometimes they can. Then we think too about first meal timing. So I talked about the first meal contents, meaning that the protein and the resistant starch can be good adjuncts for that, but the timing can also matter. So if you are struggling with hunger and cravings, you can test having that first meal within an hour of being awake. There's good data saying that this practice can improve your cortisol awakening response, and that can also be a factor with affecting the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So your body has better control of stress regulation when you have a meal early along. There are a lot of habits of skipping the first meal. Some can do well with that. But if you're really prone to cravings and if your stress hormones get high, just know that that can worsen it. So test that out too. Another rule would be fiber categories. So not just how many grams of fiber total did you get, but how many categories of fiber have you consumed in the day? And to get that, think about food categories. And fiber is coming from plant foods, so maximize your plant food categories. Think about lots of veggies, uh, greens, cruciferous, alliums as being good categories to target, also high sulfur veggies, also APACA veggies, things like parsnips, carrots, parsley. Also think about fruits and many types of fruits, uh, cold weather, temperate climate tree fruits, things like apples and peaches and pears are awesome. Berries are wonderful, melons, citrus, tropical. Think about combinations of those. And nuts and seeds, not as one thing, but as two things. You know, have, have nuts, have seeds, have a variety of them. Have different ones from day to day. And then beans and other legumes, you know, beans and peas, which make up legumes. So add those in as well. Uh, pintos, black beans, lentils, split peas, green beans, uh, good foods, lots of mixtures of those. And last off, intact whole grains. So brown rice, buckwheat, uh, barley, quinoa, including foods from all those categories gives you a variety of fibers. And that's really now thought to be the ticket towards a healthy flora, which is a ticket to a healthy everything. You know, your flora is super important. And it's not about massive amounts of probiotic pills. It's about a lot of diversity of fiber types to feed the flora more than anything. And Along those lines, think about your produce intake. If you are hungry and it's out of control, grab some of the unlimited foods. Uh, Kieran's made so many awesome unlimited food recipes. You can find these in the Adrenal Reset Diet, the Metabolism Reset Diet. Our next book will have more of our recipes too. But, but yeah, these are ways you can have all the foods you want, really. <laughs> and you fill up. You know, I just had a, a good lunch with some uh, black rice, some salmon, some broccoli, and... Uh, some cherry tomatoes, yeah, yeah. And there was some leftover broccoli. And I put that away till later. When is the last time that you went and binged on leftover broccoli? <laughs> it doesn't happen. Those things fill you up and then you're done. So adding in the veggies, the unlimited foods, that's also a powerful habit. Next up would be caffeine. For many people, a few cups of coffee or tea per day is completely harmless and there may be some health benefits from it. But there are a lot of us to where it gives us cravings. So the reason that caffeine boosts your energy is because it raises your blood sugar, believe it or not. It's like a stress hormone in your body and it, it pulls glucose out of stores and raises it in your bloodstream. So even if you don't have sugar in your coffee, when you have coffee, you have sugar in you. You know, you raise your blood sugar levels. And for a lot of us, it's just like eating sugar. You know, you get a spike and then a drop. I didn't even talk about reducing sugar on this one, but yeah, high amounts of sugar all at once sets you up for future cravings, and caffeine is no different in that regard. If you have coffee and tea all the time and you have strong food cravings, strong appetite, give it a shot. See how you do without it. And know that it won't show up clearly in the first day. It might take you about three weeks to see how you really do adjust to being off of it for a little while. So take three weeks off, 
if at the end of the three weeks, you're no better from it, go back to it. But if you are, well, you've got another tool. You've got more control now. And you can then test and see how much you tolerate before it does set you back in those ways again. Next up, here's a big one. That's sleep. Boy, there's been so many big dramatic studies showing that even a night of goofy sleep can make someone look diabetic. It can make their blood sugar go all over the place. So prioritize sleep. There's an argument that the sleep that you get in the earliest portions of the night, like before midnight, may be more powerful and helpful than sleep that you get later on, like um, late evening or in the early morning. So sleep often, <laughs> sleep early, <laughs> and see if that doesn't also help with the cravings. Next up is exercise. And this one is such a beautiful, awesome thing. You know, having it regularly in your life changes a lot. And think about it in terms of structured exercise, but also in terms of breaking up times of immobility. You know, cultivate some good habits by which on the days where you're sitting a lot, which, you know, for most of us, if we're working, we're often sitting. And if we're not working, we're often sitting too. So it's often a huge part of our time. So develop some habits whereby at least every hour you get up and move around, you know, walk around the house, do some yard work, some housework, find some ways to just make yourself into a busybody at least once per hour. Now, the pitfall about exercise is that if you really have food cravings and you're training hard, some of us end up craving more than we need, even in higher quantities. And that threshold may be around four or 500 calories of exercise per day. Now, that's pretty intense exercise. That's usually more than an hour. So if you're staying under an hour in moderate intensity, probably not a big factor. But know that if you do struggle with cravings, really long, hard training may make you overfuel. Just put out numbers. Let's say you burn 600 calories in a workout. If you're someone like me, you may find yourself craving 1,000 calories after that 600-calorie workout. So sometimes, believe it or not, good exercise at really high amounts can make managing your cravings an uphill battle. So just something to keep in mind. And then we think about satiety and the overall satiety effect from foods. This is fascinating. And it's something to where I've heard people theorize that some foods fill you up longer than others. I had one friend that I talked with back and forth about this and she said, oh yeah, fat will fill you up for four hours, protein fills you up for two hours and carbs fill you up for one hour. Like, huh, where's that from? Those are very tidy exact timeframes. Uh, what, what, what's the source of that data? And there have been studies done in which people are given different foods. Because that's the thing, we don't eat carbs. We might eat oatmeal, you know, or we might eat um, jelly beans, but we don't actually eat carbs. And we also don't eat protein. You know, we might have a sh protein shake, we could have a piece of chicken, but how do actual foods affect our satiety? And are the numbers that tight and that predictable? So one of the better studies that was done, it gave people controlled amounts of different foods when they were at a set amount of hunger. And then afterward, they were observed to see how soon they wanted food and how much food they wanted afterward. And from all of that, each food is given a satiety index. So a higher satiety index means that, that a set volume of one food would fill you up for longer than the same caloric volume of a different food. A low satiety index means you ate that food and you were hungry soon afterwards, you needed lots of food. A high index that filled you up, and when you did eat, you didn't eat as much. I want to share a screen with you that'll show you a satiety index. Let's pull this up. Here we go. So this was from the satiety study, and each of these foods was ranked compared to white bread. White bread was arbitrarily set at a value of 100, just so that was like a place to start from, and all other foods were proportionately higher or lower than that. Now, when you glance at this, you know, some things aren't surprising. There's a lot of low numbers for things like cake, um, donuts, cookies, crackers are close to white bread. You'll see some things like um, muesli was not as high as you might have guessed. Uh, white pasta was not all that high. And what this means is that those foods had satiety levels similar to that of white bread. Now, if you look at the high numbers, the further you get above 100, those are foods that will fill you up longer. So in general, foods that had more protein, more starch, more fiber, and more water had the highest satiety scores. So check out, here's the list with the most filling foods at the top of the list. Uh, potatoes, boiled potatoes. Here's our resistant starch again, you guys. Uh, this was an outlier. 
there was no other food even above 225, which was lingfish. Lingfish is codfish, same thing. So codfish was filling, but potatoes were like through the roof. There was like, they were first by a landslide. <laughs> then we saw fish. Uh, oatmeal was up there really high too. Oranges, apples, brown pasta. Beef was rather high. Baked beans, grapes, whole grain bread, uh, other breads, popcorn. So we see it go on down. And these highest foods have the greatest impact upon satiety. So if you do struggle with food cravings, think about these high satiety foods. Now, those managing your thyroid health, cod is not one of the best seafood types in terms of iodine. However, the satiety of different seafood types is pretty similar one to the next. And an easy parallel change you could make would be halibut or squid for a similar texture and type of seafood with similar satiety effects but without the iodine overload. But take home message is that if you're hungrier more than you want, have some more potatoes. <laughs> I don't see barley on this list. I don't think they tested barley. I'm guessing that would be a rather high food too. It's got a kind of a waxy amylopectin. But yeah, potatoes, oatmeal, barley, peas. I don't see peas on here. No, they would probably be higher as well, I would guess. But those three foods, three, four foods, probably make up half of my caloric intake. I mean, no joke. Those are my favorites. I do a lot of them. And if I don't, if I have less carb total or carb from other sources, I'm hungrier more than I want to be. So yeah, powerful stuff. Now, another thought is just how processed your foods are in general. Uh, Dr. Kevin Hall, PhD Kevin Hall, did a really good study in which people were allowed to eat as much as they wished. One group was given mostly highly processed foods. So things like cakes, cookies, uh, Twinkies, Doritos, uh, sauces, you know, processed meats. Another group was given foods as well, but very unprocessed. So brown rice, uh, whole grain bread, uh, vegetables, fruits, you know, just, just simple foods in their basic state with herbs and spices. And eating as much as they wanted, what happened was those in the processed foods ate more than 500 calories per day more than those on unprocessed foods before they filled up. So if you are struggling with cravings and food intake, think about how much you're getting of just whole foods versus processed foods. And last up, think about the tastes of the food you're getting. So I had some tra training in Ayurveda way back when, and they talked about these different tastes and the importance of getting all the tastes on a frequent basis. We've got data saying that sweet and salty, and now also data saying that fatty foods, that those are foods that when we have them, we get somewhat numb to those tastes and we demand more of them to feel satisfied. So it's almost, almost like an addiction and the more we have, the more we want. So yeah, so salty, very sweet and very oily or very fatty foods, greasy foods, they give us a sweet tooth or a fatty tooth, you know, however you want to call that, or we like salty. And the amounts we wish to have keeps going up. However, the tastes that counter that include sour, bitter, astringent, starchy, and umami. So sour foods, uh, I love I love rye breads. You, know, you can easily do vinegar on various foods. And these are things that decrease sweet cravings. Uh, bitter foods, there's not a lot of those, but we, get, we do get that from some herbal teas, from some dark greens as well. Dandelion greens are good examples of that. And also from culinary herbs, they contain some bitter, like turmeric does. Astringent, that's not really a true taste. It's more of a drying effect. And we get that from things like the less ripe bananas or the, the beans. They have some astringency to them. And then starchy, well, this is back to potatoes leading the game again. So yeah, potatoes, starchy vegetables. There's a distinct taste from starchy foods. It's not the same as sweet foods. And if you leave starchy foods in your mouth, they eventually taste sweet because amylase breaks them down. But initially, they do not. So going out of your way to favor the sour, bitter, astringent, starchy, and umami, and going out of your way to minimize the highly sweet, artificially sweet, very salty or very fatty foods. So there's 13 big tips to help to cut down those cravings. I hope that's useful for you. I completely understand with the struggle, the struggle, the struggle that cravings and inappropriate hunger can be. And if that's been an issue for you, I hope this is useful to make that less of a factor. All right, take great care, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.